Hi and welcome to this week's My Marketology Lab. I'm Tony and I'm the Head Marketologist. In this week's lab we'll be identifying and discussing the key web design trends to look out for in 2018. I know 2018 seems a long way off, but if you want to stay ahead of your competition then you need to plan ahead. Now, no matter what industry that you're in, and no matter what your business does, your website is your online shop window. For a large number of businesses, the website is the only asset that they have to promote the products or services. Building and developing a website can be time consuming and can be a money pit, but getting the design and user experience right is important for increasing conversions. Ultimately, this is the purpose of your website whether that is to generate leads for you to contact later or to sell something directly such as with an e-commerce store. If you're going to offer the best user experience and by default increase your conversions, you're going to have to stay on top of future trends in web design. Now that's the purpose of this week's lab. I want to highlight some developing trends in web design that may prompt you to make some changes to your website. So without further ado, here are the top web design trends that I've identified that you're likely to see come to the fore in 2018. So the first is the greater use of negative space, or as we've called it, minimalism plus. You'll definitely have noticed this trend developing over the last couple of years, such as the examples on screen from Apple. Increased white space and less distractions are separating the better performing websites from the rest. Visitors to your website don't want to see everything in one place. They want to see the one thing that they're visiting your website for in a clear and concise format. The second is bold typography design. So as with the increased or should I say decreased minimalism in web design, typography design is also changing along with user behavior to keep your headlines and content as clear as possible. Typography needs to support this, not distract from it. Being bold is completely different to being distracted. Only use fonts and sizing that support your message and purpose. Don't try to overcomplicate it for the sake of graphic design. Visitors want to easily find and easily digest the information that they're looking for, i.e. your content, so keep it simple. The third point are cinemagraphs, GIFs or GIFs, and complex UI animations, so basically memory saving video alternatives. Now there's a massive drive on mobile first design. Again, this is nothing new, but load times have to be considered when it comes to web design. The search engines are flagging up slow loading sites and penalizing them in the search results. Concentration spans are also decreasing. Again, that's not a new concept. So video formats are some of the best ways of getting information across quickly and easily from a user point of view. Unfortunately, video files increase load times as a general rule, just due to the sheer size. So how do you get around this situation? Well, you can use such things and animations as cinemagraphs, which you can see there with the, the wine. It's a static image with some motion involved. You can use the, the GIFs or, or GIFs, as you can see there in the middle section as well. And we've also got UI animations. So as you can see, just as the, the scroll happens, the icons just change slightly. So again, they seem like small things, but they just highlight and just increase that user experience again. Um, so each of these examples is slightly different, as you can see. Now, there are certain situations where the use of these can increase conversions, not just for retailers. Um, any industry can benefit from the use if they're used correctly and without overdoing it. So like anything else, don't overdo it as well. So show behind the scenes of your business, your services or your products being used or just to highlight some all important information or features, as, especially as you can see in the UI animation there as well. So the fourth point, are meaningful scroll triggered animations. So we've all been on a web page that seems to scroll infinitely. Maybe the content was too long or the company was trying to do too much in just one page. No matter what the reason was, they could have improved the user experience by giving the scroll action some meaningful triggered animations. Again, not just for the sake of it though, this is a big mistake to stay away from. If you can include some animation that adds to the user experience and also supports the content and context of the page, you'll definitely make the scroll a pleasurable and engaging experience for your visitor. This in turn increases stickiness to the page 
and obviously the more engaged the user is with your web page and with your content as long as it's what they're looking for obviously then the greater the chance of you getting those all important conversions again whether that's sales or leads or whatever the purpose of your site is number five intelligent chatbots and language processing so again i have to make an apology at this point in time, to be fair, you can't create any content about any trends without mentioning chatbots and artificial intelligence. Now, bots are a long way away from taking over the world, but consumers in every industry are now getting used to conversing with them as the first points of contact with a business. It needs to be considered when looking at the design of your website. How could you potentially include this functionality as a service to your visitors and what benefits would you see from it? As we highlighted in our video on creating chatbots a couple of weeks ago, you can create bots easily, quickly and for very, very little cost. Including them in your website is also a quick and easy process. So as bots are adopted into the mainstream, which will happen over the next year, you will see them appearing on most websites. Even if they're just there as a gatekeeper for questions from visitors who are quite early in the decision making or fact finding processes. The next point are sticky elements. Now I've separated this into two. There's the bottom sticky elements versus top sticky elements. This is coming around as a development from mobile first design. Mobile users are used to clicking on call to actions and links at the bottom of the screen as you can see on that mock-up that we've got on our screen there as well. As this behaviour starts driving web design, you'll start to see elements becoming sticky, which is basically when an element stays in its position that it's in. Now, for this, we're particularly looking at the bottom of the page rather than the top. You'll be used to seeing navigation bars at the top of the page that stay there when you scroll down. But what we're looking at here is actually mobile users being already trained into expecting to click at the bottom of the screen. So as I mentioned, traditionally nav bars and banner ads were kept sticky at the top of the page. They still are on most websites, but you might have noticed adverts on blog sites now sticking to the bottom of your mobile browser experience in particular. Now that's only the start of the options that you'll have available to you. So you need to always remember to think from the user's point of view, and that'll help you to decide on what's best to keep sticky at the bottom of your pages. If you find through your analytics that most of your web visitors are on mobile, consider adding these elements in as sticky elements to the bottom of the page rather than the top, and it'll be a much more natural process for your users to click on those elements. So next point are secure webs and secure apps. Now these are even more important with upcoming GDPR and data protection changes in the UK as well. Trust is a major factor to anyone who visits a website and that is any website. We all know that malware is bad and that ransomware is even worse. Add to that the changes coming next year regarding GDPR and data protection and your website is suddenly going to need some work in most cases anyway. Can users trust your downloads? Can they trust your forms and your data protection policies? Can they trust that you look after the data? Using HTTPS to protect confidential online transactions like online banking and online shopping order forms um, is the standard today. But given the rapid expansion of that ransomware as well and malware, soon users will expect a secure experience and a trusted certificate on any web page they visit and interact with. This is one that a lot of companies are still getting the, the, the grasp of. The next are progress spectrums. Now this might seem only like quite a small thing. Now the thing is, these small things add up to create quite big things. Now user experience when it comes to your web design is the biggest thing that you need to consider when you're designing, which is why I'm mentioning progress spectrums. Now progress bars, which you can see on screen there, from campaign to content to recipients to delivery, um, hasn't changed much. The, the actual progression bars, how you notify those users um, where they are in the stages of the process hasn't changed much since the early days of web design. They tend to be things like tick boxes. Um, standard progress bars break that user progress down into a series of steps, such as you can see on the screen there. But in reality, we don't experience the world in that way. We experience time and events in a sort of fluid and a more sort of organic way. So if you, as an example, I suppose, think about walking to your nearest shop, do you measure your progress in steps um, that you've made and steps left to take? 
or do you see it more as a progression from far away to nearer to arriving? A progress spectrum, such as you can see there, is quite a simple thing, but it's a much more natural way of depicting the progress that a user has experienced along what could be a broad and continuous spectrum in which different events and steps seamlessly flow along. So again, this is just a design thing, but it's a very small thing that will add up to quite a big thing in the user experience front. So again, another consideration, maybe you'll start seeing these trending. The next is a term called disinformation architecture. So basically the world, and in particular the digital world, has become so complicated that it's increasingly difficult to organise it and actually make sense of it. So disinformation architecture is basically a term that's been increasingly used in the user experience community. It is a subject all to itself, but to boil it down to the very basics, it's the process of organising and arranging misleading and heavily filtered information so that people can understand a more simplified and accessible version of reality. So that's a lot of words and it probably doesn't make a lot of sense to you unless you've come across this term before. So let me show you sort of an example um, of what it is and what it means. So if you think about a web website, web design and web process and procedures, you're trying to make everything as easy as possible for people to sign up for your service on your website or to contact you. But on the flip side of that, you may have come across companies that make it pretty much impossible to find out how to cancel their services. You may even do that on your own website. And that's basically one of the ways that you can sort of, whether it's sort of a moral thing, I'm not so sure. Um, you know, you should really be honest with your users. But at the end of the day, if you make it a little bit more difficult to cancel than it is to actually sign up, um, it's obviously playing into your hands a little bit. Another way of looking at disinformation architecture is also, as you can see, example there is of clickbait. So what you're basically doing with clickbait, again, whether it's the right thing to do or not, is up to you. But clickbaiting is basically using a headline to a blog or to a post or to a video or some piece of content that is not necessarily a, a fully accurate version of what you, your content is, um, but it's something that will spike a person's interest to get them to click onto it. So you're trying to bait the click. And again, it's a way of, I suppose disinformation architecture is a way of kind of deception in a roundabout way, but it doesn't have to be as strong as that. It can just be make it easier for signups than it is to make a cancellation. Um, sign up to our newsletter on your website could be a form to cancel um, a product or service might have to be a phone call so it's those little steps there and it's something that you are starting to see a little bit more often on websites such as buzzfeed in particular um, the clickbait topics and titles on there are there just to get the clicks as opposed to trying to give you a full idea of what that post is about in the headline itself so moving on stock images taking a back seat and they're going to be in decline now web visitors are always going to be looking for information it could be text it could be video it could be image formats but they're definitely visiting your website to find out something they want to see the real you or the real information that means they don't want to see stock imagery there's a time and a place for it but if you want to be sort of authentic moving on from the disinformation side but if you want to be authentic and give people what they want your pictures have to be yours they have to be honest they have to be authentic now from time to time you will visit a website and you'll recognize an image that you've seen somewhere else or that you've probably even used yourself what you've got to think is how did that make you feel you were probably put off a little bit and maybe lost a little bit of trust if not all of it in the company who owns the website or the blog that you're looking at it might not have been enough to drive you away from the site but it definitely will have made an impact on you now this is exactly why stock images are going to take a back seat in web design going forward they aren't really that effective anymore and they negatively impact the user experience again if somebody's looking for the same information from companies who are offering the same types of product or service if they see the same images as well what sets you apart from the others you don't want visitors to go through your website and go through that journey of oh i've seen this image before it looks like somebody else why are they any different so get rid of the stock imagery use authentic maybe you've created yourself whether you've taken the photos yourself, whether they've been done professionally, they need to be authentic. 
And the last point are grid layouts. Now, these are expected to become a real trend going forward. Obviously, inspired by um, sites such as Pinterest, grid layouts break up images into sections, providing different angles or different colour blends of a picture, while looking well organised, neat and artistic at the same time. That obviously takes us full circle and back to the first point of that minimalism. Grid layouts are something that can be used by businesses for a variety of purposes on marketing material, as well as being sort of cool amongst plenty of different sectors as well. It's just a way of getting information organised on screen, make it clear, make it concise, give the person just what they want from that visit and nothing extra. Reduce that noise, reduce the distraction, you will increase conversions. So I hope that you found this video helpful. Keeping your website up to date, not just with the content, but also the design and functionality, will help you to deliver the best user experience for visitors to your site. This increases the stickiness of your website, keeping visitors on there and looking around for longer. As visitor time increases and bounce rates drop, conversions will increase. So keeping a website fresh is much easier, quicker and cheaper than developing a new one from scratch. So consider maybe split testing some of these approaches alongside your current website design to start optimising for conversions. Now as usual, we're always open to any questions that you might have or suggestions for future topics for our labs. You can use any of the usual social channels to contact us. Alternatively, send an email to us at hello at mymarketology.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel now, if you haven't done it already, so that you'll never miss any of our future labs. And last but not least, thanks for calling by. I'll see you again next week. Bye for now.